This is the second most beautiful four-door sedan ever created. But overall, despite what the internet and their reputation might have you believe, they're actually, they're not that bad. Also, as, as good as it looks, there are a few issues. Forget anything German. This thing leaves all of them for dead in terms of just feel and a sense of engagement. According to the internet and folklore, Alfa Romeos are unreliable. Are they? What goes wrong with these? How are they aging? What do they like to live with on a daily basis? Most importantly, but should you buy one? But before we answer all of that and so much more, here's what you need to know about the Giulia. Firstly, often considered to be the backbone of Alfa Romeo's renaissance, the Giulia was positioned to take on the likes of the BMW 3 Series, the Mercedes-Benz C-Class, Audi A4, and Lexus IS. Designed, engineered, and manufactured in Italy, the Giulia first appeared in Australia from 2017, and it's still, technically, the current model. However, over that time, Alfa Romeo have given this thing quite a few updates, notably in 2019, 2020, but most substantially in 2023. While the engine choice internationally is extensive, here in Australia we have just received the single diesel, a fire-breathing bi-turbo V6 and a turbo 4, with both petrol power plants available in a couple of states of tune depending on the model, while power is sent exclusively to the rear wheels via an 8-speed ZF Auto. Now as far as trim specs go, we initially received the Giulia in four different flavours, however as of 2020 Alfa Romeo reduced that to three, but as you can see, even those can vary. Now being a premium European car, you'd expect this thing to be available in a whole host of different special editions. But here in Australia, we've only received five of them. Although one of them was the truly bonkers GTAM, so I suppose that kind of makes up for it. And then we come to one of the most appealing aspects of the Giulia, and that is the price. Although, if you bought one of these brand new, you might want to skip ahead because this next section could be heartbreaking. The most affordable examples are kicking off from the low $20,000 mark, about $23,000. At the other end of the spectrum, and excluding the bonkers GTA models, prices top out at around about $160,000. If you're wondering, GTAMs are asking in excess of $400,000. That means the Julia might take out the award for the biggest difference between cheap and expensive of all the cars we've reviewed. But why is all this heartbreaking? Well, this very car retailed here in Australia for about $75,000 when brand new. Just six years later, its current value is around about $30,000. That's just a loss of $45,000 in value. And to put that into context, a Lexus IS of the same age and asking about the same retail price, they're currently asking around about $50,000. So they've retained about $20,000 more value than this. And yeah, like sure, the, the Lexus certainly lacks any of the Italian charm and romance of this. Actually, it kind of lacks any charm and romance at all, but it might be the smarter financial decision. And speaking of smart financial decisions, if you're gonna be hemorrhaging money through depreciation, it does make sense to dull that pain with the very best finance package. Simply head to the Julia cheat sheet on redriven.com or hit the driver link down below because that way, driver will source you the very best finance package from dozens of different lenders. The entire package is customized to suit your needs. There are no hidden fees and the entire thing is done easily online. Plus, if you do all of that via the link or via the cheat sheet, we're gonna give you a free $150 fuel voucher. Huzzah! Okay, now look, I'm gonna do my best to stay objective through this video, but between you and I, I adore this car. This thing does very, very naughty things to me inside, and I can, I can feel myself falling more and more in love with it as every second passes. Also, I'd like to apologize to you now. During this video, I am going to butcher a whole bunch of Italian pronunciations. I wish I was well-versed enough to get them right, but I'm not, but I'm doing my best. But you know who did his best and absolutely nailed it? It's Marco Tencone. I'm kidding, it's Marco Tenconi. You know why? Because he designed this. For me, this is the second most beautiful four-door sedan ever created. In first place is obviously the Alfa Romeo 159, but this is, this is a very close second. With so many cars, their aesthetics are reliant on the color or the trim spec or the wheel choice, but with the Giulia, it doesn't matter which one you're looking at, they're all just gorgeous. You know, it's funny, BMW's design department have seen these things driving around for the last few years, and it's like they went, my God, that is beautiful. How about we do the opposite? Now look, I could just talk about the design elements of this thing for days. It is that beautiful. It is just a piece of art. But there are a bunch of things, yeah, you need to know. While the exterior design, it doesn't change between trim specs and models, what you get 
it does. The early base models get Bison on dusk sensing headlights, LED DRLs, rain sensing wipers, front and rear parking sensors, and a reversing camera. But spec up to a Veloce like this, or maybe a Quattrofoglio, and the wheels grow from 18s to 19s, and the headlights become adaptive. The Quattrofoglio also adds some sexy muscular body enhancements, and while the 2023 update is technically a facelift, you'd have to be a hardcore Alfisti anorak to spot the differences. I mean, the design was perfect from the start. Why change it? And the same can be said for the interior, but we'll get into all of this in a second. Also, as, as good as it looks, there are a few issues. First up, what do you get inside? The big question is generally Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's good news if you're looking at post-2019 models, they do have it. Pre-2019, yeah, sorry, no Apple CarPlay, no Android Auto. Although, like Charles that owns this car, fitting Apple CarPlay and Android Auto to earlier models is pretty simple to do. This is a system from ENG Custom in Italy and it's great to use and according to Charles, has worked perfectly. Oh, actually also, a massive thank you to Charles for lending us your Julia. Thanks mate, you legend. Actually, if you have a cool car that you'd love to see featured on Redriven, let us know in the comments or shoot us a message on the socials. Now aside from the infotainment system, even in base models, you're gonna get everything that you'd expect. A pretty decent eight speaker sound system, Bluetooth, leather upholstery, selectable drive modes, and all of this and more. The Veloce like this, it gets the sport seats, the leather is also upgraded, and the stereo gets a hell of a boost, plus all of this and more. Then the Quadrifoglio, it goes all out. You get carbon fiber and Alcantara carpet bombed all over the place, a premium hi-fi system, the DNA drive modes, they get a race mode, plus all of this and more. Now obviously the crazy GTA models and the special editions, they all have their own list of different features, not to mention everything that comes with all of those upgrades. But if you do need all the specific details, head to redriven.com and check out the awesome and completely free Julia cheat sheet. But back to this interior, it is design perfection in here. See, Audis are known for their very sophisticated and almost minimalist design language, but for me, as they age, they, they risk getting a bit boring. This adds just the perfect amount of Italian flair. And then there's just the driving position and these seats. Like, you sink down into this car and it wraps around you. You can tell that the designers were focusing on the driver for this, but at the same time, it, it doesn't feel overly performancey. It still feels luxurious and comfortable. It's almost like if Gucci were to make a active wear style three piece suit, it would be the interior of this car. Even the little details, like the way these paddles, I love that they're attached to the actual steering column and they're not with the steering wheel. And unlike plenty of other cars where the paddles are almost an afterthought, this is like they've designed the paddles first and then put the steering wheel on top as they're just beautiful to use. Also, all of the ergonomics, I hate to say this, weird for an Italian car, but all of the ergonomics are just perfect. Where the starter button is, where all the controls are, where everything is, it just makes total sense. Now the materials in here, they are gonna vary depending on the trim spec and the year model, especially from 2020 on, those interiors copped a hell of an upgrade. But even in this, it's fantastic. Everything you touch feels premium. The tactility of everything you use is great. Wear and tear, this is used as a family car all of the time. Excellent, the leather still feels supple, getting a little bit shiny, but that's easily fixed. There's still texture on the steering wheel. All the plastic stuff, all of it, feels good, not too scratched up. Obviously, every Julia is going to vary from car to car, but this one, superb. And the practicality up front, you have 2.5 cup holders here, 0.5 because you've got a cup holder for the best coffees, espresso, ristretto, something like that. Small pretentious, the ones I love. Little cubby bin here for your phone and bits and pieces. Actually, this is really smart. Charles has put his garage door remote on a piece of Velcro so it doesn't slide around. Smart move, Charles. Great size glove box, okay size door bins, and a little hidden compartment in here which is felt lined for your sunglasses, and Charles wears Ray-Bans. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly 15 centimeters taller than another gorgeous Julia, Julia Roberts. This is in my driving position. And it's okay, so my knees are just rubbing against the back of the seat, not a whole lot of headroom. The seats themselves, very, very comfortable, not as supportive as the front, but yeah, nice place to be. One thing that isn't negative in the back, there is a seatbelt for the middle section, but the transmission tunnel is so huge and there's not a lot of foot room in here, so I'd hate to be sitting in the middle. As far as wear and tear on this car, it's got over 70,000 Ks on it. Kids spend heaps of time back here, but honestly, you'd never know. The leather is wearing really well, the plastics on the back of the seats, nice. Great for wear and tear again. Then as far as practicality in the back seat, you've got your own air vents, you've got a USB port, you've got map pockets here, you've got rubbish sized door bins, but a pull down armrest with again, two cup holders and a cup holder for the best coffees, maybe on this case, uh, let's say like a macchiato. Also, you can pull down 
the center the center seat to have access into the boot. Then in the boot, look, it's really deep in here, so there is good space, but the aperture actual height is a bit small. So if you've got like a really thick suitcase, not gonna fit, but a positive, you can pop the seats down from here. So you got even more space. Okay, so what's it like to drive? Look, firstly, we all know that the Quadrifoglio is an absolute dream to steer. That has been well documented. But here in Sydney, it's also a really good way to lose your license. See, in the real world, away from a racetrack, a Veloce like this is all the performance car you will ever need. See, this actually has a better power to weight ratio than a Subaru WRX, and that thing is plenty fast enough in the right set of hands. Plus with this, short of the Quadrifoglio's forward thrust and soundtrack, this still gives you pretty much all of the wonderful Alfa Romeo characteristics that you want. Plus you're gonna save yourself about 40 grand. The steering and the ride and handling, excuse me for a sec. Oh. Okay, forget anything German, forget Lexus, forget Jaguar. This thing leaves all of them for dead in terms of just like feel and a sense of engagement. Even at normal sensible speeds around town, just like this, there's a real sense of occasion with this. It makes you feel special. Whereas let's say an equivalent Audi A4, it can just feel like a nice Volkswagen Golf at these speeds. Also, when you change up the driving modes, it really does transform the personality of the car. With a lot of driving modes in other cars, it just makes the ride really hard and the steering overly heavy. With this, as I said, it changes up the characteristics of the car. Also, and apologies to the loyal Al Fisti out there, but previous Alphas, yeah, they're fantastic at all the charm and romance stuff, but then you hit a few potholes or try to live with it, and it all, sort of falls apart. This doesn't. There's a genuine sense of high quality. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't feel like Lexus levels of high quality, but honestly, it's not far off it. Really, the only negative that I can come up with with this particular car is that the auto can feel a bit hesitant with the transmission, like a, like a DSG or a dual clutch, but that's about it for negatives. Basically, this thing gives you everything that you'd want from a premium style sedan and more but just with a huge dose of Italian charm and charisma and romance. Surely that's a bloody good thing. The only real issue with a car like this is that being so enjoyable and engaging to drive, it maybe encourages you to push a bit hard and sometimes some owners push them far beyond the car and their limits. So what happens then? Now in terms of safety, to take you through this, this being a work of art, it does seem only right that we show you the safety features in sort of a Italian art house film kind of way. Now, welcome to the section of the video that you're going to assume is going to go on forever because Alfa Romeo, but you know what? It's actually not too bad. In fact, Alfa Romeo took out the top spot in the 2023 JD Power Quality Survey. So you could say that things have come a bloody long way in a few years, but it's not perfect. Let's start with the exterior, firstly with the boot. So the cables that run in here that control your brake lights, the more you open and close it, those cables can get damaged over time. The problem is it takes out your tail lights. That throws you a tail light warning error message on the screen. It can also take out your AEB and also your cruise control. The good news is it's not a tough fix and it's actually a good little weekend job. Next up, it is the sunroof. Apparently they do not like hot climates and they can get stuck open. The problem here is one owner claimed that Alfa Romeo quoted $10,000 for parts and labor to fix it. That's insane. And what did he say to that quote? Alfa Romeo, no. <laughs> but seriously, the cost of OEM parts and labor on these can be an absolute nightmare. And that includes the wiper blades. The good news is we have a solution to that. Why not save yourself some money and get some of the best wiper blades we've ever used by hitting the wiper tech link down below. They're easy to order online. They're gonna be delivered to your door. They're super easy to fit. They're gonna wipe great. And that link is gonna get you 15% off and free express shipping. Huzzah. 
But then back to the car, there are also a bunch of electronic gremlins. But there's a common denominator with those. We'll get to that in a sec. Now, problems inside pre-2020 models come with a bunch of complaints about the infotainment system. Apparently, it's a bit slow and the Bluetooth can get buggy dropping in and out. It's not too hard to fix. Sometimes it's a software update or maybe you should do what Charles has done and just ditch the whole thing and fit this. But the big issue in here, just like the exterior, it's electronic gremlins. The issue is generally the factory battery. It is just known to be unreliable, and especially on early models, it needs to be replaced ASAP. See, even a slight voltage drop, it can lead to error codes and a whole bunch of different electronic malfunctions. In some extreme cases, the car will just not start. It might not even unlock with the remote and the boot can get stuck closed. Now, according to the owners groups, generally the first telltale sign is that the rear demister stops working. And bad news here, even some people that have replaced that battery, they're still having these drop in voltage issues. Actually, speaking of the owners groups, one particular owner noted that to avoid this happening, this is his shutdown procedure of the Julia. Here we go, I've got to refer, I've got to, refer to this. First of all, turn off the auto wipers, then turn off the Bluetooth on your phone, then unplug anything out of the USB B port and then shut down the car. Basically, it's the same turning off procedure as turning off a fighter jet. But as far as other owners fixing this, look, some owners just charge the battery with the battery charger, but even then the results can be inconsistent. Actually, you know what? Because of these issues being so inconsistent, probably the best thing to do is join the owners groups. We did to do the research with this and their, their knowledge and help has been incredible. The owners groups, depending on what you've got, there should be an answer in there somewhere. The other thing you might want to do is another thing we did when researching this video, and that's go and talk to a whole bunch of Alfa Romeo specialist mechanics. You guys are legends. But speaking of mechanics, mechanically, what goes wrong with these? I'm not a mechanic, so I can't tell you, not qualified to, but Jim is. The two litre petrol in these, nothing too special here really. It's a Stellantis engine, formerly Fiat Chrysler automobiles. Uh, it's the same engine you'll see in a Wrangler and a Cherokee and some Maseratis too. They're actually fairly reliable. There's no one big common issue that causes catastrophic failures or breakdowns. They don't have the common timing chain issues that nearly all of their European equivalents have. They don't really have serious oil consumption issues either. They don't even have oil pissing out everywhere, which makes me wonder if they are actually even European at all. They do unfortunately have a lot of battery issues and electrical gremlins though. But mechanically speaking, look, the problems they have are kind of random. They do have a few issues with turbos and some boost leak issues. And of course, you know, the coolant leaks from all the plastic parts like radiators and cooling system expansion tanks. They do occasionally have high pressure fuel pump issues and injector issues. And they are direct injection, so you are going to see some inlet clogging over time, which typically means a chemical or worn out blast, which is, you know, not a big deal. But those mechanical issues, definitely not what we'd call common. Now the 2.2 litre diesel in these, it's pretty much the same thing you'll see in the Wrangler and Cherokee. They have an okay reputation for reliability. With really only the usual DPF and EGR and some turbo and injector issues, but typically they are on par, if not better, than a lot of their European equivalents. Servicing here is key. You must service them at least every 10,000 kilometres. The factory recommends every 20,000 kilometres, which is absurd, it just won't last. Do the timing belt and water pump at 100,000 kilometres, and if you do that, you shouldn't expect too many issues with it. And now the big gun, the 2.9 litre twin turbo, actually also fairly reliable. These have port injection and direct injection, so they're not gonna clog up your inlet tract, which is a good thing. There are a few reports of high pressure fuel pump failure, but again, not really common. Now, more seriously, the timing chain. Now, it's not a very common problem, but there are a few reports of it. And typically, like a lot of modern day engines, that timing chain is at the back of the engine, which means the whole engine and transmission and subframe has to come out. It's not that complicated, really, compared to everything else, but it is time consuming and very expensive. But also I just want to emphasize, it's not a very common problem. Now, servicing is the key with problematic timing chains. The dealership recommend every 15,000 Ks, I would recommend every 10,000 Ks, and if you're leaning on it occasionally, which you should be, you should be doing it every 5,000 Ks. Now the six speed manual they use, now I'm gonna murder this, in the Quadrifoglio, is a ZF unit. That's actually the same gearbox you'll see in some Land Rovers and BMWs. Now the two versions of the ZF 8-speed auto, look, we've talked about this before, they're widely used by just about all manufacturers in rear and all-wheel drive applications. Very strong, very reliable, 
if you service it, you're very unlikely to have any issues with it. Now in the drive line, the all wheel drive transfer case seems to be the weak point here. They do fail, um, not terribly common, as do the rear diffs. Also problematic, they can be sometimes noisy, sometimes they can have catastrophic failures, but yeah, not hugely common, but yeah, it does happen. Overall, brake wear and tire wear on these is pretty severe, so factor that into your ongoing costs. All of these, all the engine options, typically most of the problems they have are not mechanically related at all. Most of the issues are electrical. Wiring issues and software glitches, weird ECU ghost codes, electrical switches, solenoids and actuators. Typically they are the problems these cars have. Now the enthusiasts will call them quirks and idiosyncrasies. Your mechanic will call them a pain in the ass. And some of them can be quite difficult and expensive to fix. But overall, despite what the internet and their reputation might have you believe, they're actually, they're not that bad. Okay, so after all of that, should you buy one of these? Look, honestly, this has less to do with the car and way more to do with who owned it previously. Many owners will lease and not actually buy a Julia with no intention of ever keeping it for the long term, often delaying or even skipping critical maintenance and servicing. Others will go into ownership expecting the Julia to perform in reliability terms like a Japanese or Korean car, which are often designed and engineered to take incredible levels of neglect and continue working. Whereas Italian cars, actually European cars in general, they have strict maintenance routines that need to be adhered to to maintain reliability. If you can guarantee that the Julia you're looking at has been maintained to the most fastidious levels, hopefully by a passionate owner, and you'll continue to do the same, yes, buy one. It's far from perfect, but it can be an epic car. However, if there's even the slightest doubt that it's missed a service or two, or there are any signs of misuse, no, do not buy it. Way too risky. Please just wait for the perfect example of one of these to pop up or maybe let your head roll over your heart and buy one of these instead. But if you're not gonna buy this or that, what would you buy instead? Let us know in the comments. See you next time. $160,000 should get you to... Designed, engineered, and manufactured in it. What the hell was that? <laughs> wow. Swooped by a rogue leaf. Okay.